Welcome to my YouTube channel where we dive deep into the world of finance and investing. Today we will be taking a closer look at one of the most popular and profitable companies in the market, Amazon. As we all know, Amazon has been dominating the retail industry for years. But how have they been performing in the stock market? In this video, we'll be analyzing the Amazon stock price, its historical trends, and what the future might hold for this tech giant. So if you're an investor or simply interested in the world of finance, grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. Amazon is an e-commerce and cloud computing company. The company is headquartered in Seattle, Washington and was founded in 1994. The ticker trades on the Nasdaq, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa, Zicha, Vienna, Swiss, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Bulgaria, Colombia, Santiago, Kazakhstan, Lima, Italian Bourse, and NEO Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 1 trillion market cap, they're trading at 101 a share, and they have 10.6 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they were generating lots of free cash flow in 2019 and 2020, but it looks like they're investing a lot in CapEx because they have negative free cash flow in 2021 and 2022, a big negative. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that goes up dramatically from 11 billion to 21 billion to 33 billion, but then is negative in 2022. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that's up to half a trillion in 2022. Can you imagine half a trillion of revenue and you're still operating at a loss? This is their income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. That was 514 billion in 2022. Let's dig deeper into that number so we know what it is. Here's a breakdown of their revenue from their 10K, 2020, 2021, and 2022. So of the 514 billion, 220 billion is from their online business. They do have physical locations and people can pick up packages there, but they could also buy things there. So if they order something online and pick it up in a physical store, that's counted in online stores. But if they just walk into a physical store and buy something, that's part of physical stores. They generate $118 billion from third-party sellers. Because as you know, Amazon has a state-of-the-art fulfillment center. Unlike eBay, they do a lot of shipping themselves. Not only do they do shipping, they also have to warehouse products and there's lots of logistics, so they charge a fee for that. Because a lot of people use FBA, Fulfillment by Amazon. They buy products and ship it to Amazon, and Amazon warehouses those products and ships them out themselves. You can do fulfillment by merchant, so I could list things on the Amazon website and ship it out myself. I have to, of course, pay shipping costs, and I have to deal with the customer if they have any complaints or returns. I have to answer all those questions. But if I do FBA, Amazon handles all of that. $35 billion from subscriptions. Most of that is monthly and annual fees for Amazon Prime. But there's other things like digital video, audiobook, they have lots of services. They generate $37 billion from advertising. They're number one in cloud computing. They have like 37% of the market. They generate $80 billion from that. And a bulk of their revenue is in the U.S. And that grows each year. That's up to $356 billion. Germany's down from $37 billion to $34 billion. The UK is also down at $30 billion. Japan is up to $24 billion and the rest of the world $70 billion. Let's go back to their income statement. Below revenue is cost of revenue. These are all the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. Then you have your operating expenses. These are all the expenses not directly related to generating the revenue, such as marketing. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income, and that's low in 2022, a lot lower than prior years, half of 2021. They received $1 billion of interest on their investments. They paid $2.4 billion of interest on their debt, which is the most they've paid. And the reason they have negative net income in 2022 was this large negative in other income and expenses. This is likely an asset impairment when you decrease the value of an asset on your balance sheet and pass through the loss onto your income statement. So I would just focus on operating income when looking at the income statement, not so much net income. 
because it can be really skewed by other income and expenses. Below that is pre-tax income, your taxes, then your earnings or losses from investments in other companies, and then your net income, which was really high in 2021, a negative in 2022. This is the company's statement of cash flow is the top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. So even though they had negative net income, they still generated 47 billion of cash flow. It was really high in 2020 at 66 billion, but they're spending so much in CapEx over 60 billion now. So they have negative free cash flow in 2021 and 2022. Hopefully this large investment in CapEx leads to greater growth in the future. They're also adding a lot of debt. They added 63 billion in 2022, pay down 47 billion. So they increased their debt load 15 billion in 2022. They did buy back 6 billion of capital stock. They don't pay a dividend. So another way to reward shareholders is to buy back stock. Let's look at the capital structure. 146 billion of equity, 140 billion of debt. They're 51% equity, 49% debt. And they have about 70 billion of cash on their balance sheet. So they could pay off half their debt with the cash on their balance sheet since their net debt is 70 billion. And I use the lowest whack on Finbox, 10.8%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 850 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $630 billion. We divide that by 10.6 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $60. They're trading at 101, so they're trading at a 70% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Their revenue forecast for 2025 is 706 billion. For 2024, 629 billion. And for 2023, it's 557 billion. I continued this trend into 2026 and I got 783 billion. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So in 2019 and 2020, they convert about 7% of their revenue into free cash flow. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 7%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. And I assumed they would have a negative free cash flow in 23 and 24 since they had negatives in 21 and 22. The website Simply Wall Street is on the other side as me. They're at 154 a share. They're saying it's 35% undervalued. 37 analysts priced this stock and the average price target is 137. The low is 106, the high is 192. Another 49 analysts priced this stock and the average price target is 138. They're saying it's 38% undervalued. So I'm the only one that's saying the stock is overvalued. This is where the stock has been trading the last five years. It did get up to about $200 a share, but it's come crashing down ever since then. But I think in the long term, it should be okay. They're just going through some growing pains. If you invested in this stock five years ago, at one point you would have been up 175%, but currently you'd be up 36%, while the S&P 500 is up 53% in that same time frame. Their beta is 1.25, so the stock moves a little more than the market. It's down 39% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is down 11%. The 52-week low is 81, the high is 168. And the stock is trading between its 50-day and 200-day moving average. Still a really popular stock. 60 million shares are traded each day. Of the 10.2 billion shares outstanding, 9.2 billion are on float. 60% are held by institutions and a little more than one half of 1% of the shares are shorted. They've done four stock splits, a two for one in 98, a three for one in 99, another split in 99, a two for one, and then a big one, a 20 for one in 22. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have been at $130,000 at one point. But if you're still holding on, you'd be at $76,000 today. That's a 23% annual return, a 660% total return. The CEO's salary is $175,000 and their total compensation package is over $200 million. 59% of the company is held by institutions, 31% by the general public, 10% by insiders, 0.1% by public companies, and a really small percentage by the government 
and private companies. They employ lots of people, 1.5 million. That's gone down a little bit in the past year. But so many more people make a living off this company by buying and selling things through their website. The bald-headed Jeff Bezos is the biggest shareholder at 9.7%. His value is $100 billion, but it used to be a lot more. The next biggest shareholder is Vanguard and BlackRock, State Street and Fidelity. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 46 companies in the same industry as Amazon. And if Amazon has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. They're by far the biggest company on this list. They're a little smaller than the other 45 companies combined. They spend a ton in CapEx. They have an average debt to equity ratio. They do not pay a dividend. They're losing lots of cash flow by investing so much in CapEx. They have really poor ratios. They generate a lot of revenue. They're still growing at a fast pace at 24% five-year annual revenue growth rate. And they have a negative ROA and ROE since they have negative net income. So in summary, predicting Amazon stock price can be tricky because it is affected by numerous factors, including economic conditions, competition, and consumer behavior. However, some basic principles can help predict its price to some extent. Technical analysis considers past price patterns to predict future trends, while fundamental analysis looks at the company's financial statements to assess its growth potential. I also highly recommend keeping an eye on macroeconomic events, such as interest rate changes and trade policies, as these can have an impact on Amazon stock price. Ultimately, making an accurate prediction requires a thorough understanding of the broader economic climate and how Amazon fits into that landscape. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.